Health Coalition on Virginia's Eastern Shore. Even though I'm, I'm an instructor in the Department of Pediatrics at Eastern Virginia Medical School, which is in Norfolk, Virginia, um, <clears throat> I also owned a home on the Eastern Shore of Virginia. And if you are familiar with the map of Virginia, it's this little peninsula of land that juts down from Maryland. And it's not really connected to Virginia, um, except for by the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. But truly, it is one of the most gorgeous spots in the United States. Um, <clears throat> it, it, uh, it's surrounded by water on three sides, the Atlantic to the east and the um, Chesapeake Bay to the, to the west. And so there are beaches and bays and, and countryside that make it a natural playground. And, um, and it is an agricultural community, so they grow fruits and vegetables for the rest of the world. And, you know, the Eastern Shore is world-renowned for its seafood, and so lean protein. And yet, the people there are severely overweight and obese. 70% of adults are either overweight or obese. Um, they still smoke at, a, at an astounding rate. And we know that Smoke, uh, the tobacco and uh, obesity are the number one and number two causes of early death and disability. So in living over there <clears throat> and enjoying all the beauty that I'm surrounded with, I just really could not relax until I researched the health statistics, started talking to the um, health department director and said, we've got to do something about this. So we started a health coalition about <clears throat> four years ago, and it's going strong. We've been well supported by the CDC uh, through an Achieve grant, the Virginia Department of Health, the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth, which is tobacco funds, and tobacco settlement funds, and now the National Institutes of Health. Prior to that, <clears throat> in my capacity at Eastern Virginia Medical School, we have a 20-year-old um, coalition called the Consortium for Infant and Child Health. It was one of the very first CDC-funded health coalitions. And so I've had lots of experience working in coalitions, and I um, have been well mentored by Fran Butterfoss. Any of you all who are in coalitions must know of Fran. She's written a book, Coalitions and Partnerships. If you've not read that and you are in a coalition, I recommend that you get it. So I will speak to you today from my experience with coalitions and partnerships. And um, <clears throat> what I would like to do first is to talk about the power and the potential of coalitions and um, the kind of coalition work that is, is sustainable and, and impactful. I'd like to give some examples of faith community uh, coalition work. I'd like to give you some tips for creating successful coalitions and also some tips for working with faith communities. Now that is an awful lot, and I apologize, but when I try to find out what it is that, that you all might want to hear, need to hear about coalitions, every question I asked, um, people responded by saying yes, 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 yes. So, am I right? I mean, yes. you all will swear yeah. to that. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll just get rolling on this. Um, the other thing is that I know in the audience we have people who are engaged in, in coalitions, people in the audience who may not be engaged in coalitions, people in the audience who are engaged in faith community coalitions. So you all are a, a multifaceted audience and hopefully we can add to the information that you already have and, um, and, and and, and give you some new new information. Let me get used to my new environment here. Here we go. I want to begin with this quote from Hildegard of Bingen, who was an, uh, a 12th century uh, non-mystic um, wise woman. She said everything she observed, that everything in the heavens, on earth, and under the earth is penetrated with connectedness, penetrated with relatedness. <coughs> So I think today, I mean, you can ponder that observation and take it in a lot of directions, but what I'd like to do today is to say that individually we are all gifted and talented and energetic people, but when we join hands together, 
When we, when we take advantage of our connectedness and our relatedness, sparks fly. We have more energy together, more abilities together. Um, and so that's why I think coalitions are very important because the work that each of us does as individual health people or lay leaders is important, but together we can do more. Okay, so coalition building is an intentional getting together. Um, it's an intentional agreement to collaborate. And, and faith communities already have so much uh, wonderful energy going on in them, so many wonderful people, diverse congregations, multi-talented individuals, church communities are already dedicated to social justice, already working in the community. So, Church communities are ripe for coalition work. <clears throat> but it's important when you start working in faith communities, linking with faith communities to do coalition work, that you know a few things. And so I want to make sure that we all understand the difference between faith-based work and faith-placed initiatives. Okay, so faith-based initiatives are those initiatives that the faith community participates in developing. Faith-placed initiatives are kind of when a coalition says, hey, faith community, we want to work with you, and here's what we want you to do. So what you need to understand in working with faith communities, and most of you all already work with faith communities, so I realize after two days you know this, that you need to understand the traditions and the values and the culture of your faith community that you're working with. Now, you may be a member of the United Methodist Church and you know that you want to reach out to perhaps the nearby Presbyterians. So learn a little bit more about that tradition and those cultures so that you can work together in a more respectful manner. Include faith community members in the planning and developing the action plan. In other words, that faith-placed concept doesn't work so well. People like to work on initiatives that they've had their fingers in, so include, be inclusive. And then be sensitive to faith leader time commitments. We all are drawn in a million different directions, and so churches, especially churches, and especially ministers are Overcommitted. I mean, they are on call 24 hours a day. Be sensitive to the time commitments. I have a uh, the privilege of having a faith leader on my executive committee for the Eastern Shore Healthy Communities Coalition that I belong to, and he is a powerhouse. He is connected to everybody and everything. He shows up to every meeting. I can call on him to lead a meeting anytime, but I need to be very careful about asking him to do too much because he does so much already. So just be sensitive. <clears throat> there. Now, um, we're going to work together with faith communities, um, and so we're going to work in collaboration, and as I said earlier, collaboration is an intentional proposition. It's, um, it is a relationship that you go into two or more organizations, and I say organizations instead of individuals because it's more powerful to have the whole organization be involved in the, in the coalition, um, but that's not to say that it's not important to have individuals, but just for your consideration, have organizations join together <clears throat> to achieve common goals. And, and so this relationship means that you've got shared commitment but you also have a, a shared structure and responsibility. There's shared accountability and authority. And there are shared resources and rewards. Everything belongs to everything, everyone. It's a, it's a collective. In your partnership or coalition or consortium or whatever name you want to call it, it's all the same. You want to make sure that you have grass tips and grassroots members. The grass tips are the obvious leaders in your community. Let's say in your faith community, obviously you want to have your pastor and, and other major leaders in the church, 
But then the, you have to be aware of the grassroots. These are the ingenious emerging community leaders and groups. Coalitions build communities, if you will. And, and so you want the leaders, but you want the promising leaders in the future so you can build more leadership in your community as well as your coalition. Now, I just, again, want to acknowledge that faith-based linkages for health assume many forms. You can have faith-based community members within a congregation. You can have several con uh, congregations together. You can have multiple um, faith-based communities across denominations and even across different faiths. But the one um, coalition structure that I like best, that I think works best, is um, the multi-sector partnership, where you have not only faith community, but maybe you have, I hope you have, the hospitals, the rural health networks, law enforcement, city managers, um, school nurses, other organizations within your community, like the YMCA, uh, planners, school superintendents, college presidents. Look across your community and find out who the leaders are and include them in this multi-sector partnership because healthy communities require all of this kind of leadership. The Canadians knew this in the late 60s, early 70s when they started with the healthy communities movement. They said in order to have a healthy community, you need to have a committed government and you need to have an active community. And when they defined active community, they defined all of these various aspects of the community. Law enforcement, transportation, elder organizations, faith communities, hospitals, physicians, government. Multi-sector partnerships are strong. Now, I know, I know we've already seen this definition of <coughs> this conference, but I want to I want to pay, I want you to pay close attention to what health is. State of complete physical, mental, and social well-being of individuals, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, it used to be, in the 50s and the 60s, we thought a community was healthy if it had access to hospitals and doctors, and then we added the whole mental health component. The community is now healthy if we've got psychologists and mental health hospitals. But it wasn't, again, until the early 70s that we added this social well-being. And we began to see that there are, there are needs in the community, that um, there are things in place in the community that create a healthier community. This is just a short list. There are longer lists that are available. But is your neighborhood a safe place? Do you feel at peace um, where you live? Do you, have a, do you have a home that has indoor plumbing? Um, I'm not kidding, and I guess you all know that as well from the Appalachian areas, but on the eastern shore where I'm from, it was only recently that certain communities got indoor plumbing. Do you have mold-free homes? Do you have proper heating? Um, what, what about your education system? Is it doing the job? Are kids actually going to school and graduating? What about food? Is, a stable supply of food? What about income? Do people have jobs that they need? And are these jobs that pay a living wage? And are these jobs that the person can count on from day to day? Or are they called in one day and then told not to come in the next day? So there are lots of elements that make up a healthy community. And those social elements are really very important. So in faith-based community work, we want to be sure that we are looking at all of those social aspects. And that's where the work of coalitions, I think, really can come into play best. We want to, um, we want to enable individuals to increase, increase control over and to improve their own health. So where do we find health? Just sort of shout out, give me an idea. Where do we find health? This is a question I ask when I interview physicians, uh, not physicians, but students for medical school. They're all excited about coming in and making the world healthy and 
So I said, well, tell me where health begins. And what would you say? What's that? At home. In the kitchen. In the kitchen. No, in the kitchen, that's good. Where else? In some cases, in a bottle. In a bottle? Help. I don't mean alcohol. <laughs> you mean uh, with the with baby? Oh, pills. Yeah, medication. Medication. Where else? In church. In church. Okay, so you all have, have got it completely. You know, health begins where in our homes, where we go to school, um, where we work in our faith communities. And so where you all work is extremely important. My uh, young candidates for medical school say health begins in hospitals and it begins in doctor's offices. And, um, and I have to remind them that most of the people that come to see you as a doctor are, are already sick. So you're helping them to get better. Unless, of course, you're giving them immunizations or well baby checkups, that sort of thing. But as a doctor, I plead with them, please remember that the church that you go to, the school that you send your kids to, the homes that your patients come from, that's where the real health is going to be found. And that's where you ought to focus in on some of your work. So here's what we can do as, as coalitions. We're guided by three principles, enabling health to happen, mediating in your community, advocating for, um, for things to happen in your community that make your community healthier, um, by building public, healthy public policies, creating supportive environments, strengthening community action, developing your own personal skills, and reorienting health services. Just a little bit about policy systems and environmental change. I know half of you all already have heard this, to, and, and you can recite it for me, but in asking, should we go over that? I got yes, so I'm gonna go over it quickly. Policy systems and environmental change are sustainable, lasting changes that impact large numbers of people, and that's why I recommend that coalitions focus on this level. What's a policy change? We think typically of a policy change as being something that happens in Congress or happens at the state, um, your state government, or happens um, at your city council. But policies happen in churches. Policies happen in businesses. Policies happen in school systems. And if you can develop a policy, for example, within most of the businesses in your community, um, to allow 15 minutes for exercise or uh, to um, give a discount, as Eastern Virginia Medical School is now doing, $15 off a month your health plan if you don't smoke. That starts to impact lots of people at one time. System change is um, change, changes that impact all elements of an organization, institution, or a system. So, for example, if you impact the school system, Say you pass a law that says uh, all school children will get at least 150 minutes of ad physical activity a week. Suddenly you're impacting thousands of kids all over your community. It's written down and it is impactful. And then finally, what's environmental change? And they can be physical or material changes to the economic, social, or physical environment. And the most obvious uh, environmental changes that we talk about these days are creating sidewalks where there aren't any and bike paths where there aren't any. Um, Eastern Shore, where I work, is like Appalachia. There aren't sidewalks. There aren't uh, places for um, people to safely walk or bicycle. And we forget that this is a valid form of transportation. You know, you shouldn't just have to get in a car and burn fossil fuel to get somewhere. God gave you two feet. Use them. But we can't do it unless there's a bit of an environmental change, unless our local governments agree that, yes, getting around, it does involve your feet. And, you, and so, therefore, we should begin to build. Uh, whenever we build anything new in our community, we're going to build sidewalks. Any new roads are going to have bicycle lanes. 
So these are three important um, ways that for community for coalitions to work. When we used to think of prevention, we think of these six levels of prevention, with number one being strengthening individual skills um, and knowledge, promoting community education, educating providers, and that, that used to be the priority, but that whole spectrum of prevention has turned upside down when we begin to see that impl um, impacting policy impacts lots of people, policies are written down, they are evaluated, they are enforced, and they, in, and they impact lots of people. Um, changing organizational practice or systematic change, again, same thing, impacts lots of people. Um, fostering coalitions and networks, very important. This is where you can help to begin to make those changes. Patty, can I ask you a question about that slide? Yes. So are you saying, can you go back to that slide? Sure. So are you saying, in this, that you're, in your work, you, if you're going to focus on anything, so you have your group of people that are interested in making a, some kind of public health intervention, and they say, okay, should I engage in a campaign around uh, promoting good health versus number six, you're saying put your energy in number six? Wherever you can make a change that is yeah. written down, everybody has had input into it, and it becomes policy, it happens. You can try to influence people to right. um, watch their diet all they want, but unless there's some policy in the school system that says that moms can't bring in McDonald's lunches for the kids right. or that sort of thing, it, it, it just, it's the one at a time is, is very slow necessary and lots of you all are engaged in the one at a time work and I would not say don't do it. I'm just saying this impacts more people at one time. Right, so you're suggesting that people be more opportunistic in the kind of interventions that the coalitions choose to make or the projects that they choose to focus on. What do you mean opportunistic? In other words, number six and number five are going to give you what we call where I live, the biggest bang for your buck. Right. Okay. Exactly. So uh, policy systems and environmental change is important because health problems are influenced by policies and, and environments that prevent or sustain behaviors. You know, we suggested to people that they should put their kids in car seats for a long time, but until there was a law, you know, sort of an optional thing. But now, now that it is in policy, people do it. Um, where you live affects how you live. There's a new study out, probably all of you have heard about it, that says that the town that you live in can be as, as important to your health as in your immunization schedule. Because if your town is not um, giving you cues to action, to live a physically healthful life, to eat the, the right foods, to not smoke, if you've got cues to action, to, to, to doing the wrong thing, um, where you live is going to impact your health. Major health issues aren't going to be solved by dealing with one person at a time. It's the slow way to go. Um, po policy systems and environmental change improves the environments where we live, work, learn, and play, and receive health care, and it's considered high-level prevention. I'm just advocating for that. I'm not saying that the one-on-one -on -one approach is wrong because you need, to, you need all levels of care, but as a coalition, you have a powerful um, opportunity working together and, and I would hope that you would consider that. The problem with programs is that they're one-time short-term events. Sometimes they're not sustainable. They depend on funding from year to year um, and um, it, it just is, they just aren't as powerful. So I want to talk to you just briefly about a few um, faith community coalition uh, endeavors. First of all, Seattle King County, Washington was the recipient of one of the multi-million dollar communities putting prevention to work grant and one of their many uh, initiatives, uh, coalition-based initiatives, worked with um, six churches primarily serving an African-American population, working class population. They um, are promoting health 
in the congregations using the PSE method. They created change teams, and one of the first things that they accomplished was they just got rid of the soda machines in the churches. Seems like a small thing, but church, uh, churches are a wonderful place to eat and drink and fellowship and have lots of fun. But sometimes we do that with calorie dense, you know, energy inefficient foods. So there's more to come from that. Um, I wanted to just mention the Churches United in, Mister, in Ministry, CHUM, from Duluth, Minnesota, because of just their organizing principles I think are interesting. It's for people of faith working together to provide basic necessities, foster stable lives, and organize for a just and compassionate community. Their vision is all people to be food secure and self-sufficient, able to buy the foods of their choice at the stores of their choice. And their organization goal is to make themselves obsolete, to make their community not need them anymore. I heard that in here a minute ago. Someone else mentioned that their coalition was doing that. DeKalb County, Georgia mission, uh, Live Healthy DeKalb, their, their mission is to build a community network through collaboration and partnership to improve the health of those who live, work, and play in DeKalb County. We provide health information to faith-based organizations on policy systems and environmental change strategies. Um, nearly 250 churches and faith-based organizations completed a congregation of wellness advocates training, and 150 health ministries have been strengthened or created through them. I've given you websites so that you can go and, and learn more about these faith-based communities. And of course, I couldn't give you all these examples without giving you the example from Eastern Shore Healthy Communities, which is where I'm from and, and, uh, and, and very invested in. We have a, um, a strategic plan and among the many initiatives in the strategic plan is to develop wellness policies, either physical activity, nutrition, or tobacco-free campus policies. In work sites, among other community organizations, in schools, and in faith communities. And um, so St. John's United Methodist Church adopted the first faith community wellness po policy. Reverend Gary uh, Miller, who is on my executive committee, whom I've explained to you is just the greatest guy in the world. I'm so glad that someone suggested that he be on our coalition. He's also on <laughs> the committee that nominates people to the school board. He's also on the Parks and Recreation Board. He's also on the Black United Way Board. I didn't even know there was such a thing. He's also on the regional uh, United Methodist Church Board. And so he's taken his policy to that regional board and about seven or eight other United Methodist churches have adopted the policy. The policy simply says that, you know, it is part of their um, stewardship to, to to God and to the community, that they will only serve healthy foods in their church gatherings, that they will have a, a food ministry through a traveling van, that they will sponsor walking teams um, so that their, their faith community can be engaged and be encouraged to be engaged in um, physical activity. Um, and he said they didn't need to put anything in about tobacco because none of them smoke. But we're able to share that policy that he's developed with other churches. And we have, as a result, not only had other United Methodist churches join the coalition, adopt the policy, but we've had people from other denominations as well. And, and the churches are getting very excited about this. So I'm very excited. And I called Gary before I came to talk to you all. And I said, Gary, can you just give me, a, give me your take on this faith community? I'm talking to faith communities about coalition work. Why do you, with all your busy schedule, get involved in coalitions? And I thought he'd say because, you know, because I like the strategic plan that we've developed with Eastern Shore Healthy Communities or because, you know, I, I just think it's a good thing. He said, Patty, the reason why faith communities need to get involved with coalitions or be involved in coalition activity is because well, one church can have a closed closet. Multiple churches can have a department store. One church can have a food pantry. 
multiple churches can have a whole grocery store. He said one church can build a habitat for humanity home. Multiple churches can create a whole neighborhood for people who need housing. I think that was great. And so, um, so that's why I like having faith community folks in my coalition, because I get the brilliance like um, we get from Reverend Mary Miller. Um, so the importance of partnership is that, first of all, there's an evidence base that exists to say that partnerships work. Um, if you've got a multi-sector partnership together, so people representing government, business, etc., they're going to have their antenna up, and anything that happens in the community, they're going to be sure that health is planned into it. And then um, a multi-sector partnership, because it has its tentacles in the community, will continually engage and interact with the broader community. So, I want to talk about building successful partnerships. Um, you build strong relationships and you can increase your resources working together. The challenge of partnerships, though, are very real. Um, you risk losing the autonomy of your organization or the competitive edge. I worked in hospitals early in my career and, um, gosh, in the early 70s, it was not a problem for hospitals to come together and work together. Uh-uh, they don't do it anymore. They're all competing with each other. So in, in coalition, you run into that problem. Um, sometimes there can be conflicts over goals and methods. There was another coalition on the Eastern Shore that you know, had been going for a while when we started ours, but their direction was more mental health and ours was more chronic diseases, and they wanted to join with us, but they wanted to do individual services, and we were bound, um, swore up and down to the CDC that we were going to use that policy systems environmental change approach. And so our goals didn't mesh, and I tried to explain that, you know, we'd love to work with them, but, but our goals were separate. Um, and then there are uh, scarce resources, and everybody wants a piece of that pie. So you have to be careful about time and money and status and data. And also, coalitions are messy little things. They really are. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that this is the golden answer to everything. Decisions take longer. Um, getting things in, in, in movement take longer. You've got to listen to more input. It's not like a business where, okay, here's the straight line from here to there. It's the thing that's the most economically useful to my organization. No, we don't have that. In coalitions, we've got to get along. So here are the eight steps. First of all, clarify your vision and mission. You can't go anywhere else until everybody's on the same page with what is your vision, okay? What is your mission? What is it that you want to do? And what is it in 10 years that you envision happening? Second thing, create community ownership of the partnership. And um, I think you've already heard a little bit about that from Diva. The first thing you want to get together and have a shared focus on what it is that you want to achieve. You want to have a commitment to a diversity of partners and ideas. You want to develop a trust in the process because you know you get together with a group like this. You know, I've just watched this group. People are kind of sitting back in their chairs and they don't want to talk much. You know, they're not sure how much they can trust this group to share their ideas. So you need to develop that trust level. You need to develop a feasible, comfortable participation level where people feel comfortable giving their ideas and, and you know, contributing to the dialogue. One of the first things you want to do is talk about your community's assets. Again, as, as Diva said, don't talk just about what the problems are. Talk about what the assets are. When I talk about Virginia's Eastern Shore, I talk about how beautiful it is that even all the birds on the East Coast migrate over it. It's the Eastern Migratory Funnel, Eastern Avian Migratory Funnel, and it's just the most phenomenal place in the world. So the birds know how beautiful it is. Um, people must know how beautiful it is, but I want the people to be as healthy as the land is. Um, so you want to... Um, 
create leadership development opportunities because coalitions are leadership producing machines and if your coalition is not that, that's a place you can work on. You need leadership to sustain your coalition, but your community needs leadership as well. So the leaders that you develop in your coalition will be useful for all your community. And then you want to give um, appropriate guidance and training and funds and tools to the coalition members so they can get the work done. Now, this is the real trick for coalitions, and it's taken me many, many years to try and figure this out and be comfortable with it, but you've got to develop structures and substructures at the same time that you're trying to do the good work that you want to do. If you could just close your eyes and picture, and I'm sorry, I usually have this picture in, in my presentation, but I don't today, but picture an iceberg, you know, where you've got the ice that pops up above the surface, but then below, there's about 10 times more ice mass down below. Well, below, that's your processes, that's your structures, that's, that's who your coalition, you know, your bylaws and your uh, goals and objectives and your, all of that stuff. That's all down below. That's what makes you, you be able to do the outward work that you want to do. So coalitions have inward work and outward work. And you've got to do both the inward work and the outward work. The inward work, building your coalition, the outward work, improving your community. You've got to do it at the same time. And it's sort of like flying the plane while you are building the plane. And it feels that way as well. But you've got to go through that period of time to make the coalition work. So here's some of the infrastructure items that you need to pay attention to. The lead agency and the staff. Who's going to be the lead agency, you need one of those. Somebody that can provide a place for you to meet, somebody that can provide a financial structure for you right away, that when you get grants, where, where where's the money go to, how's it dispersed? And you need a staff member, I don't care. You can try to volunteer your time for this all you want. Somebody who's paid to lead, you know, to coordinate a coalition is necessary. Um, you need partners, you need um, support. Um, our, my coalition is all grant supported, but we also from time to time get lots of wonderful in-kind support from our members. Then you need these structures like mission statements and vision statements and, and, and you need a strategic plan and you need bylaws or rules. Now I'm going to tell you a secret for bylaws because I think that's the most boring thing in the world to develop, but you need it. So you just Google bylaws, find somebody else's. They're probably pretty good, and see if it works for your organization, and the shorter the better. Anyway, that's my little tip on bylaws. You need steering committee. We have an executive committee. These are the people who, for whom the box stops with them. You need work groups once you develop your strategic plan. You need actual written job descriptions so that you appoint somebody, the chairman of this committee, they don't go, well, I didn't know that was what you wanted me to do. Um, you need meetings that hold people's attention but yet get the work done, so you've got to plan those meetings. You need communication channels. How are you going to communicate with your members? How are you going to communicate with the community? You need to pay attention to these things. How are you going to make decisions? How are you going to solve conflicts when they arise? These are people working together. We all get along. This is messy business. So decide these things in advance. Also, just because you were there when the coalition was formed doesn't mean your new folks are going to have all that historic memory. So you need an orientation program and, and training so new people can come in, get up to speed, get rolling. And then you need planning. We have an annual day-long planning retreat. And as boring as that sounds, I cannot tell you how close our executive committee gets spending that day. Um, it's a wonderful bonding time. It is a time to develop your strategic plan, evaluate what you've done, tweak it, and move forward. And then you need to build in up front. I don't need to tell you all, but you, you all know this. How are you going to evaluate your success? Name it now so you can do it later, and you're only going to do what you're going to evaluate. Isn't that right? Amen? Amen. All right. Come on, let's 
Amen. Amen. <laughs> Step four, you need to re recruit and retain an active membership. Very important. You've got to keep new people coming in all the time. Now you have to remember that coalitions are messy structures and people come in with, with preconceived ideas and they leave because maybe they don't feel respected or included or they disagree with the leadership or they are in conflict with others or that maybe their roles are unclear. Does any of this sound familiar to those of you in coalition? No? Yes? Sort of? Okay, so here's how you retain and motivate members. You um, provide skills training on leadership and advocacy. You um, have an annual retreat. That's a wonderful bonding experience. You provide, you create events that, or you don't create events, but you keep an eye open to events where you can take your members en masse to, to learn something or to contribute to a town council meeting, to a county board of supervisors meeting, to the state government. Um, invite leaders to your coalition. Invite other people to speak to your coalition. And always thank your members. Always remember to write them a thank you note, to give them a certificate of appreciation, and remember to thank their bosses for sharing with your coalition this wonderful town. It goes a long way to keeping members. Step five, I've said this before, coalitions need to be a leadership producing machine. And we don't want just any kind of leader. We don't want bossy bosses, right? We want transformational leaders, people who will lead and take other people with them. Transformational leaders are change agents. These are people who who achieve outcomes beyond what you expected. They take people along with them when they, when they make a change. Um, they lead as peer problem solvers. They're the kind of people that can get other people involved. As I mentioned to you, Rev Reverend Gary Miller comes to our coalition meetings and he has always got four or five other people that he's brought with him who are arrive in our room engaged and excited. That's a transformational leader. Think of Martin Luther King. Think of Nelson Mandela. Think of John Kennedy. Then you need to market your partnership. You need to be sure that you know what your partnership's message is. Make sure everybody in your partnership is able to give that 15 second elevator speech when asked, what is it that you do? Why are you a member? Why are you excited about what you do? Brand the coalition, develop a logo. I swear we developed this Eastern Shore Healthy Communities logo and it looks so cool that all the members suddenly stood up straighter and, and thought that they were now like a real team because they had a real logo that was, that was it, for some reason, it just put the starch in, in the membership. Um, decide who will carry the message and how, you know, you get asked an awful lot to speak, I do, to speak to town councils and you know, to, um, various other organizations in the community. Who's going to do that speaking? A lot of people say, uh-uh, oh, not me, I'm not going to do that. I'm not a public speaker. I don't. You need to develop speakers. And, and get them ready so that it's not just one person who's the face of, of the coalition. And then the other thing that you need to always, always, always communicate is your data, um, the data on the community, what, what it is you're trying to fix and what you are currently doing and what you've accomplished. Have that down and communicate it all the time. And then finally, the last thing is to evaluate your partnership because Evaluation builds the capacity within your organization to do more because you know you've been able to do this much. Well, shoot, I can set higher goals because if we've accomplished that, we can do a whole lot more. And, you know, evaluation determines whether or not you really did what you said you were going to do. So you need to hold yourself accountable. Um, and when you, as we do every year in December, we have an annual meeting and we talk about what our initiatives were, what we've accomplished, what we're going to accomplish, that, um, that builds support from our stakeholders and our funders as well as our own members. It's a very important thing. 
them to do. And then finally, step eight is to focus on action, which is what you actually join the coalition to do, right? And there are all kinds of actions that you can take. Um, not only the internal actions for your coalition, but the external actions for your coalition. Communication campaigns, collaborative tasks, whatever you've decided in your strategic plan. So these are the eight steps to coalition success. Um, and I'm going to end with a few tips for dealing with, um, for working with faith communities. If you have any questions about this, I'll be glad to answer them, or you can hold the questions to the end. Tips for working with the faith sector. This is the cue to stand up and stretch. You can do that or not. Um, first of all, respect institutional norms and values. You can work with faith communities on a national, state, local level, whichever level you choose. Be sure that you're talking to the right people. You know, get get the faith communities, regional or national office, offices involved, and knowing what you do well enough to. Um, pitch your coalition to the rest of the to the rest of the other churches. Be sure you know um, the existing policies and regulations and whatever that you need to know about the faith community that you're going to get involved in so that when you go to talk with them, you can talk with them respectfully and intelligently. And um, design strategies that equip and strengthen faith communities for sustained work, and again, policy systems and environmental change is uh, very powerful work. But whatever it is you do, make sure it's sustainable so it's not just a flash in the pan so that it can be ongoing. And then the other thing is to maintain your relationship with them over time. I talk about this a lot um, in coalition in general, not just with faith communities. You need to keep faith with your members. And that means that when you need them to do something, they do it for you, and when they need you to do something, you do it for them. Gary Miller, I keep talking about uh, my favorite coalition member, but don't tell him. Um, Gary's always asking me, you know, when I give him a few, some data, because he's going to go talk with other, other churches about these for healthy communities, and will I help him with this slide presentation or that? And, uh, I say, fine, and, and then one day Gary sent out an invitation to all of the members of the executive committee of Eastern Shore Healthy Communities. His church, under his leadership, had built a big sanctuary with a big social hall and a gymnasium. They have active basketball teams. He's done this in his, what, 20 year career, and they were paying off the mortgage, and they invited us all to come. Not one of the show wrong thing to do. I learned that one the hard way. Um, and, and so you need to keep faith. You need to remember that what the needs are of that faith community are just as important as what the needs are of your coalition. You need to communicate effectively with faith communities. Base your messages on scripture. Stay in constant dialogue with specific communities. Don't wait to, uh, for faith communities to join your coalition. Go out and ask them, pursue them, court them. And then again, work with national media uh, staff um, within uh, uh, faith communities at the national, state, and regional faith offices, um, as well as with the local uh, faith community. Um, Identify and enlist natural partners and allies. Start with people who are already involved in health. That's the obvious. Identify churches with parish nurses. Keep uh, clergy and spouses involved. You all know as well as I do, the spouse is the co-minister. So make sure that you, you, you work with them. And then show connections between your work and, um, and their charity work. So it's important that the work that your coalition is doing is also resonant with the work that they're already doing so that there's an, a natural partnership. Um, show how getting involved in advocacy can strengthen their goals and show problems firsthand. For example, if you're visiting hospitals and health agencies and collecting stories, you can, you can share the problems that you're trying to work on with your faith partners. 
Plan meetings with food, but make sure that food is healthy food. No fried chicken, okay? No high calorie sodas. Um, work around people's schedules. The one thing that I know about church members, and all of you have completely, you know, in the private conversations that I've had with you, you are overbooked. Everybody is overbooked. And, and you will do one more thing, but that one more thing might be the tipping point for you. So be aware of people's schedules and don't overbook folks. And then just stay connected. Don't wait for your coalition meeting to stay connected. I pick up the phone regularly. I pick up my roster and my phone and I just call people. How are you doing? What's going on with your agency? What are some of the issues that you're facing? You know, I was thinking about you for this initiative that we're getting ready to start. What do you think? Have those kinds of informal conversations. Stay connected. Because, after all, that's what coalition work is all about, isn't it? It's about working together with each other so that you can get the full power and the full energy of not just one person, but multiple people and organizations working together because after all everything that is in the heavens upon earth and under the earth is penetrated with connectedness penetrated with relatedness so for those of you already working in coalitions i wish you the very best those of you who are not i challenge you to get involved and see the power and i thank you for inviting me here and if you have any stories to share comments to make or questions i'm happy to answer but thank you very much.